So today what we're going to do is, I like to, I, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. So we posted the problem set two on coursework. It's a lot longer than the first one, but that's because it covers double the lectures. And I think you have over three-ish, three something weeks to do it. So it's totally doable. And uh, we reduced the MATLAB because many of you said that we didn't have enough lecture questions. So it's about half and half now for MATLAB and lectures in terms of time stuff. Come to office hours if you want help on them. I also got a lot of questions about the midterm. And I think the midterm is going to be in class 75 minutes. And the def difficulty level of questions will be somewhere in between the lecture multiple choice questions and the problem sets. The problem sets are a lot harder because you get a couple of weeks to do them as opposed to doing it in class in 75 minutes. And you'll get one side 8 by 11 paper, just like these white sheets, of any notes that you want to write from lecture slides onto there. We'll be doing TA reviews. We'll cover some of the topics in depth as well. They're not all multiple choice questions, but generally don't expect to do long essays or like long derivations because midterm is only 75 minutes. So they're generally on the, on the realm of shorter length questions, but they're both multiple choice, true or false, short answer, one word answer, one sentence answer, and some of them might be three or four sentence answers as well. One, so one, yeah, one side of a paper this big, standard printer paper. Yeah. And then uh, feel free to do the relevant questions from the final exam in the midterm and ask us at office hours. By course policy, we won't be posting the answers on coursework, but we're happy to share the answers with you in person at any session, like office hours or whatever. OK? Uh, so let's start with cardiovascular system. And I model the system usually as like two things that function side by side. One is like a hydraulic system with like pressures, volumes, pumps, flows. And one is the electrical system. And if you think about these in terms of the two systems separately and then put them together, understanding cardiac physiology is super fun. And it's, it's kind of interesting. So the first question that we're going to ask is, how much blood um, does a heart pump in a minute, right? And so anyone have any guesses or anyone remember from previous lectures? Six, OK, six liters. Any other answers? Be interactive. It'll be more fun if you guys throw out numbers and participate. Yeah, 10 is OK. Any other ones? Higher? Yeah, so actually all of these are correct. So anywhere between 4 to 30 liters of blood per minute, depending on your physiological state. We all are resting right now. And if you guys are uh, just sitting there, probably close to somewhere between 4 and 6, 3 and 6, depending on your you know, body, body weight and size. But um, if you were exercising, if you were like running, you could be pumping way, way, way more blood. So that's all normal. And what are the forces you think that drive blood flow in your body? Gravity is a big one. Yes. So pressure gradients uh, and gravity are the two main ones. And then what opposes blood flow is also the same thing, gravity. And then shear forces come in as resistance, right? Because the blood has viscosity. The blood's got proteins. The blood has got cells of various kinds. So it's thick. It's not like water, right? Especially if you guys have had blood draws, you'll see the consistency of blood is very thick. That itself imposes resistance in the form of blood viscosity, right? And then you have obstructions in older people who, over the ages, don't eat healthy, have diabetes, high cholesterol. The things that we study in the obesity lecture, they form plaques in your blood vessels. So if your blood vessels are normally this thick, and then you have plaques shrinking them this way, then it's going to affect your flows. It's going to affect your pressure. So it's going to affect the whole mechanics of this pump that functions, right? So we'll study the heart as a pump first. I'm not going to go into the atrium, ventricles, and the big vessels, I'm assuming that you guys all know the parts of the heart, right? So I'm not going to go into detail about which, where does the pulmonary vein drain into and stuff. That's an expectation that you will know that for this lecture. Uh, so cardiac output is the, number, is the amount of blood in liters pumped out per minute. We said that was between 5 and 30, right? 
Now, the two things that the cardiac output depends upon are A, how many times does my heart beat in a minute, and B, each time it beats, how many cc's or liters of blood does it push out, right? So that is why the relationship is quite simple. Stroke volume, which is in cc's or liters, is the amount of blood that the heart pumps out in a minute. Heart rate is the number of beats. And then you multiply that, you get something in liters per minute. Now, we have this circuitry, right? And there's two circulations that operate independently. One is the pulmonary circulation, which is driven by which side of the heart, right or left? Right, right. good. So the right heart drives pulmonary circuit and the left heart drives everything else from head to toe, except for the lungs, right? And that is what this shows. And the reason is for oxygenation, deoxygenation stuff, which we learn in basic physiology that I won't go over. So those are the two major circuits. Arteries are high pressure system, veins are low pressure system, right? So the way it goes is you have heart, large arteries, small arteries, arterioles, and then capillaries where the actual exchange of nutrients, oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste products like urea and stuff happens. And then capillaries become venules, veins, go into the inferior vena cava from, down, down the, from below the heart, and then superior vena cava from the head, from the chest, and from the extremities, upper extremities. And then it comes back into the heart, into the right side, right? And then from the right side goes to the lung, comes back to the left atrium, left ventricle pumps this oxygen-rich blood back into the systemic circulation. So that is the basic circuitry of the system you're going to study. This is just a figure from, I think, the classic physiology book that they always have. The couple of things I want to point out in here are that the aorta is super large. So I don't know if you guys have taken anatomy labs and stuff. You've seen it. It's like a thick pipe. It's literally like a thick pipe, which is why heart is like a pump, and then you've got all these pumps. It's like a hydraulic system. And then vena cava is also pretty big, but compared to the heart, it's not as Hard. Like if you've actually felt it, it's, it's a lot, the tissue is a lot different. So the elastic tissue and the smooth muscles between the arteries, aorta, and the vena cava and the veins varies considerably. As you notice, the arteries, arterioles have way more smooth muscle, and then the aorta and the big arteries have more elastic tissue. So they're more elastic uh, properties of these tissues. So let's go into this one. So this is a graph that I think all of you have seen before. So the questions I want to ask you is, why do you see these oscillations in the area between uh, after aorta and between before capillaries near the arterioles? Why do you see these fluctuations in blood pressure? What is that? Hmm? Pumping of the heart is one, but how does that result in these oscillations? So there's, there's figures to show that, but I'll just do it now because it's more appropriate for this question. You have these blood vessels that have some kind of uh, elastic tissue and some smooth muscle, right? So these are not like, the aorta is more or less like a, a solid kind of tube that doesn't move very much. Uh, it's still, you can still see it fluctuating in the real human, but the arteries above the aorta have a lot of like compliance. So when the blood comes in from the heart, it like expands a little bit. Right? But at the same time, a lot of blood is coming up, so the pressure goes high first. right? And then in the relaxation part of the heart, there's no blood coming in, blood, blood moving forward, and this thing compressing back and shrinking. So you get the fall, and then you get the rise, and you get the fall. And the actual values of why this decreases varies on the size of the vessels that we saw in the past. right? So di different arteries have different sizes, and so the pressure values, the raw values, will change based on those sizes. Now, uh, why do capillaries have low pressure? Does anyone know, remember? The, yeah. That's exactly right. So capillaries, so we know from various physics equations that we'll also re uh, reiterate in the next few slides that if you have a small tube and a big tube, which tube has more resistance? Small tube, correct, right? Because the diameter is really small. Now, let's say I have the same amount of flow going through both these tubes, small tube and big tube. Which one will produce a higher pressure? Small tube, right? So it's like, you know, the pressure volume relations, kind of like V equals IR for Ohm's law, right? So very simple. But now what happens in capillaries is that you have a million plus billions of capillaries, 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 12, something in that range capillaries, but you got only few big arteries. So overall, the area of the capillary system is way large, right? So you're not splitting all that blood from the aorta into one capillary. You're splitting it into like 
a million billion capillaries. That is why the capillary pressure is so low, because the overall surface area is way larger than the surface area of a big artery or a, or a vessel. Now, the other question to ask is, why is, the, why is there a difference between pulmonary and systemic uh, pressures? So one thing to just give you an idea about, the uh, pulmonary circulation gets the same amount of blood as the entire left side of the heart pumps, right? When the heart's pumping, the left and the right pump equal amounts. It doesn't pump different amounts, because that, that won't work in a closed system, right? So why do you think the pulmonary pressures are generally lower than the systemic pressures? OK, yes. That is, that is an interesting point. I'll touch back on that right after I hear the rest. Right, so essentially the pulmonary resistance is what's low. So that explains the size of the right heart muscle, because what happens is the systemic resistance is a lot higher than the pulmonary resistance. And the resistance is basically a, a derivative of all the capillaries and the vessels in the two systems. So if the pulmonary resistance is really low compared to the systemic resistance, and you're pumping the same amount of blood in each, pulmonary will produce lower pressure, because it's just a direct product relationship than systemic would, right? Which is why, as he pointed out, that the right heart muscle has to do a lot less work in the same heartbeat compared to the left heart muscle, and hence the left heart muscle is thicker. So when I give you a heart, you could just quickly look at the thickness of the ventricles and tell this is left, that's right, because right will be thinner than the left one, because it works lesser. So these are some basic rules of our circuit. One is that each part of the body gets as much blood as it needs, OK? And this makes sense because after eating, all of us try to go into a food coma, right? Why does that happen? Because a lot of our blood gets shunted from our stomach, uh, from our head all the way down into our gastrointestinal tract to digest and to absorb nutrients. So essentially, you are diverting all your blood flow by eating. I'm not saying don't eat. People should eat food. We need, we need six grams of glucose an hour to survive just to keep the brain functioning, minimal. So you clearly need to eat food. But what happens when we like binge eat or we go and eat like two burgers and fries and an ice cream shake with it, uh, that's when we get drowsy after a while because a lot of blood goes down here to take care of what went in the stomach and the intestines and takes away from the uh, head. The other thing is cardiac output is, um, it's all under nervous system control. So there's, we won't go into the depth of like autonomic feedback loops which control the circulatory system. We'll touch upon some of them. But basically everything's in a feedback loop. So there's receptors that we have in our carotids, in our aorta, other stuff basically that detect changes in blood pressure and then our body will adapt to those changes in blood pressure uh, by changing signals to the heart and to the vasculature, everything. And then the, um, let's see, yeah, so the last line basically says the same thing, that if you have a blood pressure drop, then the heart will do things like contracting the venous reservoir because because of gravity, a lot of blood pools in our legs, right? So sometimes, I don't see anyone doing this. Usually in some lecture halls, people do this. People always tap their foot, right? And they're constantly tapping their foot. What do you think that's doing to your blood pressure or your cardiac output? Increasing it. Because you have a lot of blood in your venous reservoirs in the leg because of gravity. So when you get, when, you're, when your cardiac output's lower, when your blood pressure is slightly lower, like during the middle of the day, you skip lunch, you haven't had enough water, you're gonna start tapping automatically sometimes and that in some sense will actually increase the blood flow back to your heart. And as we know, the more the venous return comes into the heart, the more it pumps out. And we'll study that relationship too. So it's all really fun and interesting stuff, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it appears darker, but not blue. It's probably a representation on like uh, the skin tissue uh, not getting enough blood. Cyanosis is probably from that. It's skin tissue, oxygen, yeah, yeah. You, it's, it's mostly in babies who have really, really bad congenital heart disease or lung disease, and they have really low oxygen saturations, levels of which we won't be able to survive, but babies do, they become more blue. Yeah, drowning people, yeah. 
because they just don't have oxygen. So this is the diagram I was drawing before, and the analogy to understand the um, the capacitance or compliance, I guess, in in case of in case of these tubes, is think of think of a balloon, right? The balloon is very floppy. You blow some air in it, right? And so there is an external pressure of the air that the balloon is working against, and then it expands a certain volume, and that and how easy it is to fill up a balloon tells us about its capacitance. If it has a really it's, if it's made of a material that has a really high capacitance, it'll be a lot easier for us to blow into it because less pressure is needed to fill up that balloon. If it's very, very stiff material, you have to work really, really hard to blow air into it. That's the same principle. If an artery is really, really, really stiff, you're going to have to, the heart is going to have to apply more and more pressure to fill that artery. If the artery is not as stiff in healthy arteries, the heart has to work less to fill that with, to fill that with blood. So that's why with old age, one of the age-related changes that happens in everybody, regardless of how healthy you are, is that your arteries become stiffer as you grow older, by the time you're 70, 80, 90. So as you become stiffer, it becomes harder for the heart by natural decline to fill those stiff arteries with blood. Nowadays, because people are getting more and more obese and having multiple problems, not exercising, getting high blood pressure, diabetes, their arteries are becoming stiffer at younger and younger ages, and so they develop things like high blood pressure, and then their left ventricle starts working harder and harder and eventually causes heart disease when they get older. So the equations that are in here, I think there's so many versions of these, but I think the simple thing that I want everyone to take home is, remember that V equals IR relationship from Ohm's law, basically, volume equals the product of current and resistance. You apply that to hydraulic system and the pressure change is a volume, the flow rate, times the resistance of any of these vessels or circuits, right? That's the first thing. So essentially it's trying to show all that. And then the compliance is basically delta V over delta P. How much volume of any of these tubes changes for every little change in pressure, right? And for a stiff thing, we would expect for a given change in a volume to have a large, large change in pressure for a stiff vessel, which would reduce the compliance, basically. Yeah. Yes. The compliance and capacitance is direct relationship. It's an analogous relationship. Elastance is the inverse of compliance. So you can look up what elastance is. It's just the opposite formula. And that's the opposite of that. Uh, the other thing to note in this equation is the top one is kind of modeling the balloon, right, which is different because that's P external is the pressure of the air and P is what the pressure inside that we blew in. This equation, P in and E out, is for a tube. So if a tube has pressure one here and pressure two here, it's kind of like the potential drop across a resistor, right? You have V1, V2, and you have R, like R in between, and that's the current that drops the voltage. It's kind of that. To, to make blood flow from one end of the pipe to the other end of the pipe, there's a drop in pressure, and that's what the P1 and P2 represent. So the equations represent different pressure values, but the concepts are all kind of the same. The next thing to remember is cardiac output, we already computed, was stroke volume times heart rate, which is really simple to understand. And blood pressure is just cardiac output times resistance. In the body, we call it SVR or TVR, which is total peripheral resistance or systemic vascular resistance. For the pulmonary circulation, we'll call it pulmonary vascular resistance, similarly. This is just basic physics. I won't go over it. Resistance parallel series circuits, like it's kind of fun to analyze um, how that works. And in the body, the majority of circulations are parallel. Because if you go back to our circuitry slide, you'll notice that all these are parallel networks, right? They're not in series. So it's like, this is, let's say, the GI circulation from the celiac trunk. This is the kidney circulation. This is the general circulation. And this is the lower leg circulation. They're all parallel branches out of the aorta. So anyone who's taken anatomy has seen, from, down from the celiac trunk all the way to the iliacs, every branch that comes out is its unique parallel circulation circuit. So you would use the parallel uh, thing to analyze that. Uh, also, the first that law is really important. The I don't know how to say it properly, so I'm just going to call it the P law. And you've got proportional to length, and I don't want to make a fool of myself, you know, in the middle of the lecture. So, and then you've got radius to force. So smaller ones, higher resistance; longer length, higher resistance. And then we talked about the n number increasing to 10 to the 9, right? When we were talking about why capillaries have lower resistance. So it's pretty simple stuff. And then viscosity is because of the RBCs deforming and other things, other proteins in the blood. And let's see what's next. So. 
this is like a simple theory that I've kind of already explained. So Vin Kessel or a Vin Kessel theory, and I think Otto Frank also helped design this in the beginning, is that essentially, if you think of the big vessel over here, the bulky one as the aorta, and the other one as a left ventricle, in diastole, there is no flow into the reservoir because the heart is relaxing and filling with blood. So the aorta is not getting any more blood. If anything, blood is leaving the aorta to go elsewhere, right? In systole, this reservoir is filling in from that. So that's basically the diagram that I was trying to draw. This is a prettier version of that, that you fill this in, it expands, and then it leaves, and then it shrinks again. That is what the compliance of these arterial circulation is, right? Um, any questions so far? This is a good pace. It's kind of basic stuff we're just quickly going over, right? All right, so we talked about gravitational forces. People mentioned veins and legs and valves. So this is what happens in normal venous valves. Blood goes down really easily, right? But, uh, sorry, uh, for blood to come up without actually regurgitating against it, there has to be a valve that prevents that blood from flowing down. Because we need the blood from the legs to come back to the heart. Otherwise, we can't keep operating this closed loop pump, right? So we have these valves that prevent the blood that's falling down because of gravity from opening these valves and going down. However, in disease states and older people, for various reasons, these valves become leaky. So now this is my leg valve. And then there's blood flowing down. If my valve becomes incompetent, is what we call it, then it'll start opening up and leaking blood down. So x amount goes up. Normally, zero should come back. But now y amount starts coming back and starts expanding this venous reservoir. So you're storing a lot more uh, blood in your veins and in your legs. And that's how the, the, the thing looks. It's like, it's not a good picture. This one looks horrible. This is, yeah. But there's, this is like not so common to see, but there are many. Um, there are many people that have varicose veins and stuff. They don't look that awful. This just felt like dramatic effect. I almost removed it, but just wanted to show you that that can happen. And you will see these big, bulky uh, things show up. Elderly people, yeah. Yeah, correct. So you use mechanical compression stocks that push and add that extra flow, like oomph to that, and prevent more blood from flowing down because they have that extra added pressure from outside. Questions? <laughs> 